So I'm going to share some, uh, some personal testimony with you, but uh, I had planned on ministering on imagination and that's what Pastor Dwayne ministered on. But you know what? There's so much to say about it. I know he could have said much more and I think I've got some things to share that will complement and go along with it. But this is a big part of my personal testimony. They advertised a book today about Don't Limit God and I wrote that 23 years ago. And then in 10 years after the Lord gave me that revelation, I had a book entitled uh, Don't Limit God Times 10. And that was 10 years after. And then just last year, I put out a teaching. I don't think we have a book on it, but I got a teaching entitled Don't Limit God 20 Years Later. And to talk about what has happened uh, in my life, it is just phenomenal. But let me just real quickly share with you that, you know, I got, I got born again when I was eight years old, 60, what's that, 66 years ago, 66 years ago. I got born again and I really got born again, but I became religious. I went to church and they taught me how to, uh, you know, it's like Julie was saying today that you got to do all of these things. And then I had this encounter with the Lord in 1968 which was 55 years ago. And I saw the glory of God, not with my physical eyes, but it was a revelation. And God showed me how holy he was and compared to his holiness, all of my righteousness was like filthy rags. And boy, it knocked the wind out of me. And I repented and I expected God's wrath and rejection when I saw what a religious hypocrite I was. And instead, I experienced supernatural love for four and a half months, I was caught up in the presence of God. And that was wonderful, but it was confusing because I couldn't understand why God would love me. Because for the first time in my life, I realized I didn't deserve his love. And so that set me on a course of trying to figure this out. And a lot of things happened. I'm just going through this real quickly. But the Lord showed me that he wanted me to start taking the things he was showing me about your identity in Christ, which I call spirit, soul, and body is... My teaching on that. And he wanted me to take those things and the grace and share with people all over the world. So I knew God's vision for my life. I knew the direction he wanted me to go and I started heading that direction. But man, there was a lot of frustration. And again, I believe just like I was sharing with you, it wasn't that God uh, made all of this frustration and kept things from working. It was all of the junk that was inside of me that was hindering the Lord from flowing through me. He couldn't trust me with things because I had all of these things. So anyway, I was, I began to start ministering. Jamie and I pastored three little churches. The largest one we ever ha held was a hundred people. And I mean, we went through hard times there. And then I started on the radio and we started seeing uh, a bigger outreach, but struggled financially. And man, I could stop on every one of these points and, and teach some really important things here. But I had a wrong attitude about finances. I was raised to believe that uh, if you know, you're doing what God tells you to do, it just automatically comes in. And I thought that ministers weren't supposed to have anything. And anyway, there was a lot of problems. And in 1996, uh, I got a revelation on finances, which began to start making a huge difference. And then the Lord spoke to me about going on, um, on um, television. He did that in 1998. And we started on television January the 3rd, Monday of uh, 2000. And uh, that was for the, any of you that were uh, remember, that was Y2K. They were predicting the end of the world. And my first broadcast, I came on and said, if you're watching this program, you know that Y2K was a hoax. And I had gone on record two years before that uh, Y2K wasn't going to be an issue. And boy, I got a lot of flack over that. But uh, anyway, that, that's when I started. And the Lord told me that that's when I was starting my ministry. And so we began to start see things work. And we doubled, actually, from the time that we went on television until... January of 2002, the ministry had grown and I was heading in the direction that God had for me. And so it's not like I didn't know what God's will for my life was. And it wasn't like I wasn't moving in that direction. But the Lord spoke to me. Let me turn over here and just share this with you out of uh, Psalms chapter 78. 
and in verse uh, 41, this whole psalm is going back and rehearsing what God did with the Israelites when they came out and how they, they just constantly turned around and rebelled at the Lord. And it says in uh, verse 40, this is Psalms chapter 78 and verse 40, it says, how oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And again, this goes along with everything I've been trying to say this morning, that God wanted to bring them out of Egypt and bring them into the promised land. He had nothing but good plans for them. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And yet they just would not cooperate. Every time they ran into a hard place, they said, would to God we had died in the wilderness. Would to God we could go back to Egypt. It wasn't that... Man, God was trying to bring them into something better, but they just constantly hindered what the Lord wanted them to do. And right here, this says that they often tempted him and provoked him. And in verse 41, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And on January the 31st, 2002, the Lord spoke that verse to me. I mean... This is probably the second most important encounter I ever had with the Lord as far as the results that it made in my ministry. And he told me, he says, you are limiting what I can do through you, through your small thinking. Now, again, I knew what he wanted me to do. And if you would have asked me, what do I believe that the end result of my ministry is going to be? I would have told you that God wanted me to reach around the world. And at that time, we were on 3%, we reached 3% of the U.S. population and we were on the God Channel, which was just beginning over in the U.K. And so we were reaching people around the world, but it was very, very small slice of everything. And uh, if you would have asked me, what do you believe God wants you to do? I could have told you and I was moving in that direction. Again, we had doubled in two years time, which most people would consider that quite an accomplishment. But the Lord just spoke to me and says, you are limiting me by your small thinking. And again, I've got this teaching. I've got three teachings on, on this that goes into more detail. But I was limiting him uh, in all kinds of ways. But the number one way that I was limiting him was I knew what his will for me was, but I wouldn't let myself imagine it is what Dwayne was talking about. If you would have asked me, I could have told you. But it's just as Dwayne pointed out a number of times yesterday that you have to see things. You don't just get words. You have to see things coming to pass. And I wouldn't allow myself to see me doing these things. I'm really limited trying to explain what I'm saying because it's hard for me to express this. But Jamie and I went through so much rejection for so many decades that I was used to it. Did you know recently in the last 10 years, I'm actually being accepted by people that used to reject me. And it's weird. <laughs> I've told Jamie before that this is strange. I'm not used to people liking me. I really am not. I mean, I've had, I've had, uh, I could mention names and you would know who they are, but I've had nationwide ministers come out and say, I'm the slickest cult that's ever been. And we've been criticized. And I got used to that, but to be liked by other ministers and accepted by other ministers is strange. And I know that Dwayne has dealt with this. We've talked about this at both of us. Uh, I went for decades and nobody knew who I was. And my point is that I kind of got that mindset that I'm never going to uh, reach people, that people are never going to, I'll reach individuals, but I, I couldn't see myself reaching large numbers of people because we'd been rejected. People had stayed away from my meetings by the tens of thousands for so long that I just couldn't ever see me doing things. And so anyway, when the Lord spoke to me that I was limiting him, one of the main applications of that was I just couldn't see myself actually being a major player in the body of Christ. If you would have asked me, I could have told you that that's what God wanted me to do, that the truths that he's given me 
are life changing that everybody in the body of Christ needs to know them. I could have told you that, but I wouldn't allow myself to go there. And you know, there's some things that made this real obvious to me right before this was in the same month. It was in the month of January, 2002. But before that January 31st encounter, I, I was uh, doing the road show on the Oasis Network in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Lynn and Kathy Mink were interviewing me. And the way that they did the program, they had about 10 minutes worth of news and weather. And then they had a guest come on and they interviewed you for two hours and stuff like that. So I was sitting out in the foyer of this radio station and uh, I was listening to them and they started into their thing. And when they got to introducing me, uh, Lynn Mink came on and he said, we're so glad to have Andrew Womack. And he says, 20 years ago, when I first got born again, God used Andrew in my life. And he was just saying all of these things about how I changed his life. And I was sitting out there thinking, how could this be? Because Lynn Mink, if you don't know him, he was the music director for Kenneth Copeland for a lot of time. And I'd seen him on television at this time. I wasn't, uh, you know, very well known and stuff. And I was thinking, how in the world could I have affected somebody like this? And when I got in there, I was just awed that God had ever used me to touch them. And then we went out to eat afterwards and I was telling Lynn, I said, man, I had no idea. I said, I just can't believe that God ever used my ministry to be a blessing to you. And Lynn just looked at me like, what's wrong with you? You've been on radio for 30 years. Do you think nobody was listening? And did you know when he said it, it made perfect sense. But see, I wouldn't let myself think that way because I was afraid that I'd be lifted up with pride. Or I know that this sounds weird to some of you because most people don't struggle with uh, fear of pride. They welcome it. But I had seen the damage and I honestly was uh, struggling with that. And when he said that, it's just like a, a light bulb went off on the inside of me that what's wrong with me? How come I can't see myself really touching people? And then there was, there was a number of things that happened. We were looking for a new place because we were in a little building that was 14,600 square feet. We had outgrown it and we needed a new facility. And while I was out traveling, Jamie went and looked at a building and it was 30,000 square feet. And when I got home, she wanted to uh, pick me up at the airport and drive me by there and saying, boy, this will last us the rest of our lives. And I knew that that was gonna be way, way, way too small. And Jamie and I share everything. But you know, it's like if you reach over to pet a dog and if every time you do that, that thing bites you, you quit petting that dog after a while. I quit speaking my vision to people, even to Jamie, because it just was so far removed from where we were that every time you'd speak it, you'd, the people would roll their eyes. They didn't always say something, but they would communicate that, you know, you're dreaming. It's never going to happen. And I just got to where I wouldn't speak my vision, not even to Jamie. And that really shocked me because I knew that someday we were going to have a huge ministry and things but I hadn't allowed myself to go there. I wasn't speaking my vision and things like this. And so anyway, on that night, it was about midnight and it just finally dawned on me that God said, you are limiting me by your small thinking. He says, I've got big plans for you. And he says, I can't do it because you're thinking so small. And so I repented. And did you know one of the first things I did, Pastor Dwayne was talking about imagination and meditating. You know, let me just real quickly say this. I'm not going to turn over there and read it, but in Psalms chapter one, verse two, it says, you know, that you have to not be like the ungodly and sit in the seat of the scornful, but you meditate in the book of the law day and night. And that word for meditate right there in Psalms one, two is the exact same word that is used in Psalms chapter two, verse one, that says, why do the heathen uh, rage and the why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? It's the same word that's translated imagine. You can't meditate without imagining. You have to see things. And so one of the first things I did was I had to start speaking. It also says in uh, uh, Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Meditation has to be 
uh, you speak it, you see it, but you also have to speak it. So anyway, the, the day after the Lord showed me that I was limiting him, I just got bold and I stood up in front of, I was at a minister's conference that we were holding in Buena Vista, Colorado. And I stood up and I repented in front of those ministers and said, man, I'm limiting God. And I said, here's where our ministry's going. And I started confessing that we were going to reach people all over the world. I started speaking my vision and I was fearful that people would reject me over it and think that I was operating in pride or something else. But I just realized I had to start speaking my vision. And I remember when I did that, I had every single person in there say, well, what's wrong with you? Everybody knew that, but you. <laughs> Instead of people rejecting me, everybody already felt the same way, but I had been afraid to speak forth what God was telling me to do. And so, uh, man, I started changing. I called my staff together. We had 25 people on staff in January of 20. Uh, 2000 and what, when was that? 2020, 2002. Thank you. That was it. So in 2002, we had 25 staff. Now we have about 1200 staff. Did you know we've increased like 46 times? Our income has increased 51 times since then to where now we have to have over a hundred million dollars a year just here in the U S and then uh, we add about 30 million to that from our other offices. We got 22 other offices around the world. Did you know all of that stuff has happened in 21 years? It has just exploded. And it wasn't that all of a sudden God started moving. God was moving all along. It was me that had damned up my life by my small thinking, fearful of what people would think about me if I began to start saying what God had really put in my heart. And I was thinking small and talking small. And because of that, I had dammed it up. And when I changed, it's like this dam broke and all of the things that God had been wanting to do in my life started flowing. And one of the major things was using my imagination. And I knew some things that God wanted, but I wouldn't let myself go there in my imagination. Did you know that the uh, dictionary defines imagine or imagination as your ability to see something not real or present? When they say something not real, they're talking about like a fantasy, like Mickey Mouse or something like that. But there, is, there are things that you can't see that are real, such as the spiritual realm. There are angels in here. There's a spiritual realm, not only out there, but inside of you. And you have to be able to see things in the spirit. You have to see yourself. Pastor, again, we're overlapping on all of these things, but hopefully it'll help you. You have to see yourself healed. You can't just sit there and quote, by his stripes I'm healed, but you have to see yourself healed. You have to see yourself prosperous. You have to see yourself as able to prosper like what Colin was talking about and, and Colin and April took this step and man, they've seen these things and they've got a bigger vision. They're seeing more things. You have to be able to see it. And most people only allow themselves to see negative things. Some people think, well, I just don't have an imagination. Everybody's got an imagination. It's impossible to function without an imagination. Did you know that your memory is tied to imagination? First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 18, I believe it's after David had given billions of dollars towards the building of the temple. He wasn't allowed to build it, but he, he laid up all of these treasures for it. And he gave these billions of dollars to the building of the temple and commissioned his son Solomon. And the people saw it and they were so blessed that they equaled his offering and they gave billions. There was nearly $5 billion worth of gold, silver, and precious stones that came in in one offering. Man, that is an offering. Amen. And he was so blessed. He started saying, God, who are we that we could do this? We were all slaves. We had nothing. And now here we are giving billions and billions of dollars towards the building of the temple and he says, keep this forever, O Lord, in the thoughts of the imagination of people's hearts. And if you really think about that, that's saying that you can't remember without an imagination. He was asking God to help these people remember it, sear this in their imagination, help them to see this. Did you know if I was to ask you, what was your house like 
that you grew up in as a kid. Now, some of you may have moved around so much that you don't have one house, but if you lived in one place, you don't have a picture of that in front of you. You probably don't have a drawing of it in your billfold or something like that, but you could tell me. You could describe the thing. You could tell me what it was like because you have a picture of it. That's how you think. It's how you remember things. You can't remember where your car is without your imagination. Did you know every one of you right now have an imagination? You know it's either parked in the parking garage and you have an idea of which level it's on and you, you know if it's on this inside wall or if it's on the outside wall or if it's on the one that's going up or you're parked outside and you've got a picture. You may not know the exact slot, but see, you, you picture things. You can't function without an imagination. Your imagination is just your ability to picture something that you can't see right in front of you. If I was to ask you, how do you get from here back into Woodland Park? Did you know you could tell me, well, you go out here on, on what we call our uh, gospel truth way and you come out to that CR 25. You may not know the names of these things, but you can see this and you can say that you turn right there and then you go to the light and you turn left and you can see those things and yet you can't see it with your eyes. You know what that is? That's your imagination. So the point I'm making is some people think, well, I just don't have an imagination. Yes, you do. You can't function. You can't remember. You couldn't get, find your car. You couldn't go home. You couldn't get back to your hotel. You can't do anything without an imagination. So you've got one. And if you aren't intentionally using it, well, then it's working against you. And like when Dwayne was talking about, they came out and said these negative things about Urias, that he would have all of this brain damage and things. You know, those words tend to paint a picture and he had to fight and cast down those imaginations. Most people let their imagination just run wild. And so what I had to do, I had to start developing my imagination. And we were in the process. We had... Uh, we were looking at places to uh, put the ministry in. And like I said, Jamie looked at this 30,000 square foot and I said, nope, that's not it. And then a hundred and I forgot, forgot 140 or 150,000 square foot building came up and it turned out we went and walked through it. And boy, that helped me to imagine big. I started walking. We were in a 14,000 square foot building and I started looking at a 150,000 square foot building. And I tell you what, that'll stretch your imagination. Now we wound up not getting it, but we got a 110,000 square foot building, which was nearly uh, 10 times as much. And I started dreaming and it was a warehouse. And I had our builder put duct tape on the floor where every wall was, where every door was. And after everybody would leave, I'd spend an hour or two walking around that building and I never stepped over the tape, even though it was just all open. I, I walked and I walked down every hall and into every room and I would open the door and I would look inside there and see, I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird not to use your imagination. <laughs> I started, I went and I looked at every room in that place and I would spend hours every night looking at this room that wasn't there and seeing if that's the way I wanted it, if that's what I really liked. And I put um, five gallon buckets down and plywood on top of it and I stood in, on top of that in a place that was gonna be our auditorium and I preached entire sermons and nobody was in there. And I preached to people and I walked around that thing and I just would pray in tongues and ask God to help me to, to start thinking big. And part of it was that in the past, every time we ever built anything or did something, our primary concern was how can we save money? Uh, you know, we, we've got a limited amount of money, man. We can't do things. And sad to say, I think that most Christians just think poor. They think that if you're a Christian that you shouldn't have the best of anything. And that's the way that most Christians do. They build things cheap. And so I just started dreaming big and start thinking about things and, and taking the limits off. When we came to build this building, did you know I designed the barn and this auditorium all at one time. We spent a year and a half with the architects and we went back and forth. And, and you know what? I walked 
this property when there was nothing here. And I saw those bills. I, I said, I want those beams. I saw those beams. And I told them what I saw and I designed it and they would draw pictures of it. And I said, no, I want it this way. And we just kept going back and forth until eventually what they wrote on paper is what I saw. And I saw this building. I designed all of these things. I walked off all of this stuff. Anyway, my point is that we were a year and a half into the design process. I'd already spent a million and a half dollars with the architects designing these buildings. And then we sat down to say, all right, are we going to do it or not? And that's the first time. One and a half years later, I said, how much is this going to cost? I had never asked what it was going to cost. I didn't do it because it was cheap. I didn't do it because of any of those things. I, just, I decided I was going to take the limits off God. And I tell you, this is where so many people miss it. God gives them an idea and the first thing they do is pull out their pocketbook trying to figure out how can I do this? God doesn't ask you to pay for it. He just asks you to believe for it. He'll pay for the things. The disciples, he says, how many loaves do you have? And they said, well, five loaves and two fish, but what is that among so many? It was more than enough. Man, he multiplied it. But see, we limit God by looking at our things. And I had to intentionally just start imagining, not only imagining uh, buildings and imagining money, but the main thing was I had to start imagining that I am going to be able to do what God called me to do. And again, I have no uh, deception about me being the slickest speaker, uh, you know, or the I'm not, I don't have charisma. I don't have any of these things. And it was, a, it was a barrier for me to overcome, to believe that God could use me. And I had to start thinking differently. And I think that this is where so many people miss it. You know, the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 26, verse three, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. Did you know the word for mind there is the Hebrew word yetzer, Y-E-T-S-E-R? And Duane talked about this yesterday. Did you know that Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, that every imagination of their heart was evil continually? And Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, where it says, now nothing that they have imagined will be restrained. That's the exact same word. That word for mind is imagination. And if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, the only definition of that word, it doesn't have multiple definitions. The only definition of that word, yet sir, that is translated mind and imagination six different times in the Old Testament, the only definition of that is conception. That's what the word means. Your mind is where you conceive things. Without me going into a lengthy teaching on this, hopefully everybody understands where babies come from. <laughs> you have to conceive babies. The stork doesn't bring them. You don't get pregnant drinking the water after somebody else. You have to conceive children. Well, it's the same thing. You have to conceive a miracle. You have to conceive a vision. And it's conceived in your mind and specifically, even more specifically, in your imagination, if you can't see it in your heart, you will never see it in the physical realm. And again, there's people that know what God wants you to do, but do you spend time conceiving it? Do you spend time meditating on it? Do you take the word and let it paint a picture on the inside of you of what you are desiring? This is why that our, our media is so... Uh, impactful today is because it's visual and you see things and constantly, you know, if, if you watch the 10 Spies Network and all you do is see the riots and the bad things going on and stuff like this, it forms opinions on the inside of you. There are people that honestly have seen so much negative stuff that's been put out about this nation that they see this nation as done for. They see this nation as failing because that's the picture that's in front of you all of the time. When the scripture says just the opposite, that when we see all of these negative things happening, then lift up your eyes for your redemption draweth nigh. 
Did you know right there in Matthew chapter 24 when it says lift up your eyes, that's the exact same word. It's anablepo, and it's the same word that is used in Mark chapter 8 when it says that God, uh, I mean, that he caused this blind man, he prayed for him, and he could only see partially, and he said, look, he made him look up another time. The word anablepo, ana means again, and blepo means to see, so it means he made him look again, or he made him look twice. And it's the exact same word that's used in Mark chapter 6 when it says that when Jesus took the five loaves and the two fishes, he blessed them. He looked up and blessed them. It's the same word. And it's talking about he saw twice. He looked past just his five loaves and two fish and he saw into the spiritual realm. Jesus saw, he saw that food feeding the multitudes. That's his imagination. He saw this happen. It's not talking about he just raised his head. Did you know that the uh, Hebrew counterpart to that over in Daniel chapter four, where uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he got lifted up in pride and Daniel prophesied to him that he was going to become like an animal and it came to pass. And for seven years, uh, Nebuchadnezzar took his clothes off, lived out in the woods. His fingernails grew like claws. His hair grew like fur and he was totally out of his mind for seven years. And then his reason returned unto him. And he wrote the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel, a, a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar wrote it. You can read it. And at the very end, he says, then I looked up and my reason returned unto me. Again, that's not talking about lifting his head. It's talking about he was able to see beyond just what was going on in the natural. And he finally had some spiritual perception and stuff. And so this is what Jesus was doing. He, he saw again, saw twice. He looked past the limitations of what he had in the natural and he saw what could be done with that. Did you know every one of us, there's not a single person in here that God couldn't just do miraculous things through you. Money shouldn't even be a factor in your consideration. Money's not a big deal. There's no shortage of money. And yet we limit God by thinking, well, God, I, if, I, you know, if I had enough money, here's what I'd do. We limit him by thinking that way. We limit him by not seeing ourselves sufficient to be able to deal with the task. And you have to intentionally start imagining things and seeing things come to pass. And I tell you, this was a major, major, major factor. I called my staff together on February the 11th, 2002, and I told them, I said, look, I don't know how long it takes to change the image on the inside. I don't know if it takes a day, a week, a month, a year, five years. I don't know what it takes, but I said, I am going to fulfill what God called me to do. And uh, I started speaking my vision and talking it. And, you know, when you do that, it kind of puts you out there. You're out on a limb. Now you've exposed yourself. And if God doesn't come through, you're in trouble. And so I just started speaking big and talking big. And again, we had 25 employees at that time. Did you know I'd been trying to go on Daystar Network for two years, ever since we went on. And I knew Marcus and Joni Lamb. I'd been on their television program. They would let me preach an hour at a time. I'd done that five times. And we were friends. And there wasn't any reason that I shouldn't have been on Daystar Network. But they, every time they quoted me a rate card, we had a media buyer and they said, they're quoting you nearly twice what they're quoting anybody else. I don't even know why that was, but it just never worked out. And within me uh, saying that to my staff, that was on, a, I think, a Friday and on Monday, I got a registered letter from Marcus Lamb. And he says, why aren't you on Daystar? He says, what's wrong? He says, it doesn't, don't worry about the money. You just send us the tapes. We will give you a deal that you cannot refuse. And when I changed the image on the inside of me and began to speak that I would do these things, boom, like that, something I'd been trying for for two years just happened. We had also been needing money. And this was right after 9-11. Uh, you know, in 2001, and you could go check with other ministries, other media ministries, that when 9-11 happened, people quit watching Christian television. They were glued to the TV set trying to figure out 
uh, you know, were we going to go to war and what was going to happen? And ministry's income just tanked. Jerry Savelle basically was going to quit the ministry and it was a miracle that he was able to pull it out. Kenneth Copeland lost lots of money. Every ministry that I was aware of began to tank after 9-11. And so it was right after 9-11 when God showed me this and it took me two months to write a letter and tell my partners what had happened and get that letter produced and shipped out. So it was two months after I made this decision to start thinking bigger. But did you know within a week after me making that decision, our income just exploded and finances began to just come in from every angle long before I could tell people about it. It wasn't something in the physical that I did. I changed my mindset and when I changed my mindset and the way I was thinking and the way I was imagining things, finances just begin to flood in. It's phenomenal. And you know, I don't normally say these things. I'm not saying this for any reason except just to bless God and to say that it works. But did you know in 21 years, prior to that time, man, we struggled, struggled, struggled. For two years, we had done relatively good since I went on television. But since the Lord showed me that, we've had over a billion dollars come through this ministry. Now, we spend it all on television and everything else we do, but I hadn't got a, a lot of money set aside, but that's pretty awesome. Amen. God blessed us. And I mean, when I change things on the inside is when everything on the outside began to change. And I'm just sharing with you, this, this goes along with what Dwayne was saying, that it was in my imagination is where most of the change happened. And it was because I wouldn't let myself see me succeeding because I was afraid I'd get lifted up with pride. I wouldn't let myself see me doing this because I had just been kind of molded by the things that had happened into being just rejected and criticized constantly and stuff like that. And it had formed a mindset on the inside of me. You know, if you would think about it, many of you, this is what's happened to you. You were told when you were a kid that you'll know you, you'll just never prosper. You may have been in competition with siblings and they were the ones who prospered. You know, my brother, he has an IQ that's higher than Einstein's IQ. My mother was a school teacher and she had access to all of our, uh, you know, uh, tests that we took. And so we, she was sitting around one time talking and she's talking about my brother Ray and his IQ is higher than Einstein's. And she was talking about him. So I just said, well, what's my IQ? And she says, oh, you were two points above an idiot, 88. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Before she died, I was sitting around and I mentioned something about that. And she says, that wasn't true. And I said, you told me that when I was a kid. And she says, I must have been joking. But you know, I'd, I always thought I had an IQ that was two points above an idiot. And I, I never, you know, I never made the honor roll, but I never had to study. I never did any study and I always made B's. I never made a C or anything like that. And so it's, I, I didn't have a complex about it, but I am saying that things like that can form an impression about you and you can grow up thinking that, you know, I just am not ever going to prosper. And you have to change that mindset. When my dad died, my brother was four and a half years older than me and he, uh, he just would do things just to see if he could do it. And he had a 56 Ford Fairlane that he took the motor apart down to the last nut and bolt in our garage just to see if he could take it apart and put it back together. And he put it back together and put dual four barrel carburetors on it. It was the hottest car in the town. And he did that and he could do stuff like that. So he was a mechanic. And that's what he did all of his life. And when my dad died, my brother came to me and he says, you know, our dad's gone now and I'm going to be your dad. Boy, that really offended me. <laughs> that really offended me. And I told him, there's no way you're going to be my dad. And so he tried to teach me to be a mechanic and just out of rebellion, I went the other direction. And so when Jamie and I got married, I couldn't screw a nut on a bolt <laughs> because I just went the other direction. And I remember when I first got turned on to the Lord that I just started trying to change that image on the inside. And I remember that we had a little serving bowl in this house that we uh, rented and I bought the furniture in the house. And, it, and when you picked it up, it was supposed to play a tune. You wind it up and it'd play a tune. And anyway, that thing wouldn't work. 
And this is small, but you know what? I've, I've still got that thing on my desk right up here. I've got that bowl. I took it apart and prayed over it. I don't know what I did, but it works. And I just used it last week. And you pick that thing up and it'll play a little tune. And it was just a reminder that I can do all things through Christ. Something that I wouldn't have done before. And you got to start breaking down these misconceptions in the way you see yourself. You know, Don Crow, who was with me for many, many years and helped us start the Bible college. I knew Don Crow's dad and he was a mean man. And uh, when he died, he committed suicide and left a suicide note and blamed his family. And he says, it's all because of you. And he tried to destroy their life even when he committed suicide. And he just treated Don terribly. And he would always tell him, you're so stupid, you can't screw a nut on a bolt without cross-threading it. And I mean, Don, as a 40-year-old man, I worked on a car with him and I'd see him literally shake, putting a nut on a bolt and he'd put it on and it would be right and he'd be afraid that he had done it wrong and he'd take it off and put, and I never saw Don put a nut on a bolt that he wouldn't eventually cross thread because of what was said about him. Did you know many of us have had Sometimes people say things like that. Maybe sometimes just life's experiences. You've gone through a divorce or you've, you, you know, you struggled in school or you've had some failure of business or just, it could be a multitude of different things, but it forms images on the inside of you. That's your imagination. And you've got to change the way you see yourself. And you can't just come up with your own way of thinking about things. That's fantasy. But when you take scripture and you read scripture and scripture tells you something that you are going to lay hands on the sick and you will see them recover. Those can't just be words. You got to take that until you see yourself laying hands on the sick. You know, I remember when the Lord spoke to me from John 14, 12, where Jesus said, verily, verily, which means truly, truly. Everything Jesus said was true. But when he had to start what he was saying by saying, I'm telling you the truth, it was, going to, it was because it was going to be so unbelievable that he had to qualify it and let you know that he's sincere in what he's saying. So he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father. And I remember God speaking that to me and telling me that I am going to do the same works that Jesus did. Now, it's one thing to hear that and even be able to quote it, but have you ever seen yourself doing what Jesus did? So what I started doing, I took every instance in the Bible where Jesus raised someone from the dead. There's eight individual instances. You can get into more if you talk about the multitudes that came out of the graves at the resurrection of Jesus and then walked into Jerusalem. But as far as individual numbers of people that were raised, there's eight individual instances. So I took them and this was way back when I didn't have a computer. I just wrote it out on a legal pad and you can't meditate on something that you don't have that information on the inside of you. So a large part of meditation is just putting the information in you. But then once you get it, you have to let that become something that you see. You have to see it. So I took all of those instances and I wrote them out and I just began to meditate on it. And again, Psalms 1, 2 and 2, 1, you can't meditate without imagination. And so I began to start imagining and I saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. I saw Elijah raise the widow's son from the dead. I saw Elisha raise the Shunammite woman's son from the dead. I saw all of these things, but then I went beyond just seeing Jesus and Elijah and Elisha doing it. I saw me doing it. And I actually remember getting on a bed and acting like I was putting my hands upon the boy's hands and my mouth upon his mouth and my feet upon his feet the way that Elisha did. And I would act it out and see it. And I know many of you think, man, that is weird. But you know what I was doing? I was using my imagination. And it wasn't very long after that, that my son died and was dead for four and a half hours and stripped naked with a toe tag on in a cooler in a morgue, but because I had been seeing it and I saw myself do it, I didn't just see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, I saw me raising Lazarus from the dead. And because of that, Jamie and I spoke our faith and our son came back to life. 
There are many of you that know the scriptures, but you haven't seen yourself doing it. This is what vision is all about. You have to use your imagination and not just fantasy where you come up with your own thoughts, but you take scripture and you let scripture paint a picture. You know, I've done this to a degree my whole life. I remember as a kid going out and measuring a tree because I read a commentary that they said uh, Goliath was nine foot six. So I marked nine foot six on a tree. And then I bent down because they said David was probably only five feet tall. And I bent down so I could see and kind of imagine what was happening. I remember going to Israel on a tour and it was a hot day and the bus stopped in the Valley of Elah where David fought Goliath. And uh, the guy on the microphone said, does anybody want to get out? And it was a hot day and nobody wanted to get out, but I did. I got out and I walked out in the midst of that valley. And back then, this has been 20 something years ago, there was nothing there. It was basically miles and miles, very similar to the way it was in David's day. And I walked out into the midst of that field, found a little stream, picked up five stones and I stood there and held them and just looked around on the mountains trying to imagine what it was like for David. And it makes the word come alive. This is why when people go to the Holy Land, they come back and they say, oh, it was life changing. There's just an anointing on that place and it'll change your life. There's not an anointing on the land of Israel itself. You ask all of the Jews who live there and don't seek God and don't know God and all of the ungodly people. It's not, the, it's not an anointing on the land. What it is, you read things, but most people never see it. When you go there and start seeing these things that you've read about, it impacts you on a whole different level. And very few people ever take the word of God and let it paint a picture on the inside of them of success. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. Many people can quote that, but do you see yourself always triumphing or do you have this attitude that, man, if I wash my car, I know it's going to rain. <laughs> and you think, what does that have to do with anything? You're, you're basically saying I'm cursed. It could go a week and no rain. But if I wash my car, I know it'll rain. It'll ruin my job. Nothing ever works for me. I never win anything. That's a mindset. And it paints a picture on the inside of you. You have this ceiling. That's what Dwayne was talking about. That tent, he couldn't look at the stars as long as he was inside this tent. The tent blocked his view. And you live in a tent that has shrunk what God can do in your life and through you. And you've got to change all of that. And the way you do it is to take the word of God. And this word is alive. John, uh, Hebrews 4.12, the word is quick, alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. This is a live word. And if you will read it with your heart and allow God, he will speak things to you. And then you have to close the book. I'm not against being in the words. You can't meditate on what you don't know, but you've got to eventually take what you've already heard and you got to quit just reading words and you got to see it come into pass. You've got to see yourself well. You've got to see yourself prosperous. You've got to see yourself that I can do all things through Christ. And until you see it, you won't see it. That's like that scripture Dwayne was talking about. It won't tarry, but it will tarry. <laughs> you can't see it until you see it. Paul said, we are looking at things that can't be seen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, if you can't see it, then how can you look at it? You look at it with your heart. And let me just use this one last example. It's, I've used this a lot, so many of you might have heard it, but it's the best example and I think I've heard on this, but there was a woman who had real poor eyesight, legally blind, had thick glasses that she looked through. And there was a healing evangelist that was coming to her church. And she had been prayed for so many times she was disappointed. She didn't want to be disappointed again. So she avoided him, didn't want him to pray for her. But he finally cornered her the last night of the meeting, make, made her take her glasses off. Then he laid hands on her and prayed for her. And he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he said, shut your eyes. And so she shut her eyes thinking, what's, what's he saying? And so he said the second time, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he yelled at her 
and said, shut your eyes. And she was wondering, how can I tell if I can see if I've got my eyes closed? So the third time he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he says, I'm not telling you to open your eyes. You've got to see yourself seeing with your heart before you can see with your eyes. And she finally understood what he said. And so she kept her eyes closed and prayed in tongues for a while. And finally she said, I can see. And he says, now open your eyes. And she opened her eyes and her eyes were miraculously healed. But see, most of us, we come and we ask for prayer, but you see yourself sick and you're waiting to wait and see something on the outside to change that image. You got to change the image on the inside before you see it on the outside. If all of us didn't come and get prayer until we had already seen ourselves well and we could see it. Most of you wouldn't even need prayer because as a man thinks in his heart, that's the way that he is. Your life is the way that you see it being. And if your life isn't the way you want it to be, it may not, you may be praying about it and asking God for it, but you hadn't seen it yet. When I started changing the way I saw things and I started seeing us growing and expanding, we have expanded so quickly. It is phenomenal. We've increased 51 times in income in 21 years. That's phenomenal. We've increased staff 46 times in 21 years. And we've now got a billion dollar building program going. And you know what? I have zero doubt about it. I am just totally at rest and at peace about it. And it's all going to come in and we're going to do it all debt free. We aren't taking out any loans on it. And some of you can't see that. Well, don't dump your unbelief on me because I can see it. I've got it. Amen. And I love it. And that's where you conceive things. To me, the conception process is better than the birth. Think about that. <laughs> Man, I just love dreaming and seeing things. That's what really winds me up. Right now, I'm just in hog heaven thinking about all of the things that God is doing and dreaming and talking to our architects and stuff. I just love this. And I've actually thought about heaven. I wonder if we, I just can't imagine that this, um, I, well, our imagination is such a vital part of what God made us to be. And like Dwayne was saying, nothing that we imagine will be restrained unto us. I, I can't even think about heaven that we somehow or another are going to turn off our imagination because it's such a vital part of everything we do. So I don't know what that means. In heaven, are we going to still be inventing things? Are we going to still be developing and growing and seeing change? I don't know, but I just know that it's a vital part of what we're doing now. And it's our conception. It's our spiritual womb. So you came here looking for vision. And man, I believe that if you've uh, been paying attention, you should have gotten vision this week. God should have spoken some things to you. If this didn't light your fire, your wood's wet. Praise God. And I believe that this is going to be awesome. Praise God. So let's ask our prayer ministers to come up here again. And in case anybody still needs anything, we want to be able to minister to you. Maybe you, you could just come today and say, you know what? I need to get my imagination going. Would you please pray for me that God would help me? And I've got a teaching out of Romans chapter one, verse 21 on four steps to staying full of God that deals a lot with this imagination. I've also got a book entitled The Power of Imagination and uh, they could help you, but we can pray with you and we'll help you any way we can. So Father, we love you and we just thank you for all that you've done during this conference. Father, thank you for all of the people's lives that have been impacted and I know that you've never made a piece of junk I know that your plans for us are awesome. And that, Father, you just have wonderful plans for every single person that's here. And we ask that you help us to get out of the way, to quit limiting what you are wanting to do in our life. That, Father, you would cause us to start dreaming. And I thank you in advance that we are going to see miraculous results come out of this meeting. And Father, individuals will be changed and then visions will come to pass and lots of people will be impacted. We just thank you for it, Father. Praise you for all of these great things in the mighty name of Jesus. 
Amen.